I like to talk about uh, the, my approach to articular cartilage. This was my area which I got into when I was uh, at Hopkins, and I, and I was very lucky to have uh, Dr. Manos here uh, also into it. So when I got here, it was interesting that uh, there's uh, a different little bit of philosophy from Europe and the US. So and it was the reason I got into it is when I was doing a lot of surgical cases, I would think I was doing a good job. Then later on, I would see some cartilage defects. And then the, my uh, rate limiting step was usually the cartilage more than what the surgical procedure I was doing. Uh, my comp, I have no conflicts of interest. I, I'm a, I like history and, uh, and I like to always give, uh, uh, you know, credit to the mentors of our past. Uh, we recently lost one of our, uh, and I, one of the people I really admire and a mentor, uh, one of our mentors, Dr. Freddie Fu. I just wanted to give a, a word about him. He was one of our pioneers in, in ACL reconstruction, the most uh, published uh, um, academician as far as ACL surgery and ACL uh, research. Uh, just moving back to history of cartilage rest restoration, uh, I like to talk about like, uh, the first uh, osteoarticular transfer was by Lexar. But uh, the two people that I really wanted to talk about was like Kenneth Preeti and uh, Paul Fikat. They started articular cartilage surgery back way in the 50s, and they were started in a lot of their procedures. So what they did is similar to what we do now. The Preeti drilling was essentially drilling through the subchondral plate to uh, stimulate mesenchymal stem cells to come out. Or any, or make a clot, and then Fika thought even a little bit further into it. He's like, instead of drilling, why don't we just remove that uh, cortical bone and a hard bone and see the uh, underlying uh, mesenchymal cells come out significantly more? Johnson did something like a spongialization, but instead he he made it into an abrasion arthroplasty, which he removed that subchondral plate, so you can see more of the stem cells coming out. And then it was you guys all know about microfracture, which started in 1999. And it has been the gold standard for about 25 years for us. And recently, it's lost favor, and I think uh, deservedly so. Uh, we've had some new procedures. And then Coventry started the osteochondriolograph. Bill Bugby started it in sports medicine. And now we've gotten the cellular um, restoration techniques. And Lars Peterson started it about 30 years ago. So we're starting to do more cellular uh, restoration. Uh, the incidence of articular cartilage injury is interesting because when you do an e-scope or arthroscopy, if you see 50 to 60 percent of the time, you'll see a chondral injury. And this is by Carl. Several studies have shown that. However, only about 10 percent of these injuries are full thickness. And that's more importantly because I, because that was what becomes symptomatic. Uh, the yearly incidence has tripled over the last 20 years. We're seeing more. It's something I think we used to see, but we didn't pay attention as much. But I think now that we've seen it and we know how to treat it a little better, uh, the surgical aspects have also tripled and the uh, diagnosis also has gone up. Uh, the other thing is we've seen more ACL injuries and we know that in approximately 50% of ACL injuries, there's gonna be some type of cartilage injury. However, we, we ask why aren't we not seeing all these patients a ton of these patients in the uh, in our clinics because most of these uh, the majority of these injuries are asymptomatic and they're asymptomatic because they're small and they have shoulders that they can actually protect itself the most common procedure we've seen is microfracture and chondroplasty and the main reason people do that is because it's cheap and technically simple uh, one of the other things i want to stress is our knee joint and most of our joints are biomechanically made to last a lifetime I mean, Danielle uh, Ponzio in, in her study showed that marathon runners actually had a lower incidence of osteoarthritis than the uh, compared to the relative population in the U.S. So, and then also there's a study shows that recreational runners had a lower incidence of OA versus compared to sedentary people. So it's important to understand that the knee is made to last forever. What usually happens is an insult or injury to the, the cartilage, which leads to this cascade that causes significant issues in coming on. The point I want to stress with this slide is that if you look at the number of knee replacements are done compared to the number of cartilage surgery, and then if you look at the number of cartilage surgery, look at the chondroplasty and microfracture compared to the restoration techniques. So the end point of all degenerative joint disease is a total knee replacement. But we all know from Parviza studies and several other studies that one third of these patients under the age of 55 are unsatisfied and they complain of not having a normal knee. 
one third, one half of these patients can get back to normal recreational activity with a total knee. So we know that total knee replacements is not a good option for young patients. That's why we're trying to shift people to this other category. Instead of chondroplasty microfracture, we can increase restoration and prolong their cartilage and knee. The most important thing to know, I think, in this lecture would be is, is about the osteochondral unit. It, this is the we used to think of the knee as, uh, I think, the basic building block of the knee is the osteochondral unit. Everything else in your knee protects that, and your ACL, your ligaments, the muscle dynamic. What is the, the function of the knee is based on the osteochondral unit. It's the subchondral bone and the articular cartilage above it. We used to think uh, that they, they were, there was no crosstalk between them, but they're significantly uh, tightly coupled. There's a significant uh, cellular communication between the uh, mesenchymal uh, cell changes goes across. And one of the important things I want to uh, mention here too, that the environment that this osteochondral unit is, is very important. Uh, Christian Latterman did a study on biomarkers and he showed that if these, if you get an ACL tear and you fix it perfectly, even though everything else looks good, there's no injury, but if the uh, milieu or the synovial milieu or the environment of the knee is in an inflammatory state, people go on to get degenerative joint disease even later on, even if everything else looks perfect. So you have to make sure this inflammatory state is okay. We did a study at Hopkins when we looked at uh, the subchondral bone. So we looked at both sides. We looked at the cartilage and then we looked at subchondral bone. If the subchondral bone changes, like if it starts getting some trabecular thickening or even uh, signs of uh, increasing cortical bone volume, compared to the total volume, we saw that the cartilage above the knee starts to wear down quicker within even a year. So what happens is there, the, the cartilage is soft. If the bone gets too stiff, it can actually damage the cartilage above. The cartilage protects the subchondral bone. So essentially the osteochondral unit is what runs the knee. Everything else, your ACL, PCL, all these ligaments are protecting the subchondral bone so it can last forever, as long as we can. The hyaline is the type 2 collagen, is the type of college, articular cartilage that we like. It's very good against uh, shear. It also has a low friction uh, coefficient of friction. I mean, if you look at the best, it's like 0 0.003 that, uh, against Teflon, which is about 0 0.04. So it's much better than Teflon. And it also distributes joint loads over a wide area. This is what uh, Dr. Peter Verdonk was talking about a couple of weeks ago when he was talking about the small femoral condyle. The smaller you make the condyle, the more load goes on that smaller area of cartilage. So you're increasing peak forces on it and as far as predictability. The other thing I wanted to show on this slide is that it, that cartilage does not heal. You get these micro damages, you'll get little fibrillations. You can get a chondral fracture, which is goes to the tide mark. The tide mark is before you get to the subchondral bone. And then you can actually get an osteochondral fracture, which goes into the subchondral bone. And then that's when you get your growth factors come up and try to heal it with type 1 collagen. So how does injury happen? Usually we can't change anything on the left, age, genetics, and systemic factors. But usually it's an injury, overload, or some type of instability, or even subtle instability can changes the joint and biomechanics. They cause an inflammatory response. And these biochemical pathways start uh, these metalloproteinases and enzymes that actually break down the knee and ultimately leads to degenerative joint disease. Remember, cartilage does not have any nerve fibers, does not have any vascularity. It has only the subchondral bone is where the pain is felt. And as you can see, as the bone in the cartilage gets damaged, the subchondral bone responds by making intralesional osteophytes. Uh, it increases angiogenesis and it increases the nerves in that area and you start increasing pain. So what are our goals? Uh, we, we try to decrease pain and improve function. One of the other goal is to make tissue that is comparable to the normal articular cartilage. We, we call that hyaline-like repair tissue. And then finally, we want to match the biochemical properties of cartilage and subchondral bone. So if your bone is too stiff, the cartilage is going to fail. If the cartilage is not a durable repair tissue, it's going to load the bone, and then you can get these, we call these bone marrow lesions. Ultimately, it's to prevent degenerative joint disease at a young age, which in the U.S. it can be contributable to about 190 billion a year. So the presentation of articular cartilage, which is uh, one I wanted to talk about a little bit, it, it's pretty relevant, is how do they present clinically? Most of these 
injuries present with pain and swelling. In my uh, clinical practice, if I ever see anybody with recurrent swelling or pain and without an um, injury, it's always to me chondral or patellofemoral until proven otherwise. They give mechanical pain, like a clicking or catching. And then the most important thing I, I want to stress in this is also to look at instability. So these patients will have these, with the smaller lesions, you can see how the shoulders protect you. But with the larger lesions, with the larger lesions, when the patient steps into that flexion, he'll feel like he's falling into a pothole. They'll feel this instability sensation. And that's dependent on location. A lot of these other other things that you have to look into is history of injury or trauma. Somebody with a previous ACL may have uh, possible cartilage injuries. We know 50% of them do. Previous surgeries is another risk factor. And it's important to see them, especially if you're thinking about surgery in the future, possibility of incisions, future surgeries as well. As far as physical exam, I think range of motion is very important. Uh, Shelbourne always talks about you have to maintain range of motion. The more you lose range of motion, the more you load a certain area of the knee. So if you have that whole convex act, uh, act aspect of the knee, you have less load. Effusion is always popular, uh, it's probably the most common symptom. I think as far as chondral injury, as I mentioned before, anytime I see a recurrent effusion, I always think chondral and possible, and it's usually patellofemoral. Alignment is important, we will talk about that. Joint line tenderness is as far as meniscus. And atrophy. Atrophy is important to see if compared to the affected sides versus the normal side, atrophy will tell you how long it's been going on for. Because you don't see atrophy until about a couple months setting in. Uh, and then you also look at ligament instability. And then as I mentioned before on the physical exam, you should always look at incisions from previous surgeries. Radiographically, it's important to understand uh, what you're looking at. Uh, I always think it's important to have when anywhere you uh, to have an experienced musculoskeletal radiologist. I think we have a great ones here at Ascotar, and it's very nice to discuss cases with them. Uh, generally, we do long-standing views. And then the MRI is probably your gold standard to look at cartilage. Uh, it's good for two reasons. One, it shows, lets you look at concomitant injuries or concomitant pathology. And then you can look at the articular cartilage location. Uh, there's two scoring systems. I won't go too far into them, but uh, the Amadeus is is now usually these are in three T MRIs because you can actually see it better and you can see marry the uh, you can see the area measurement depth underlying structures and these are all key factors in how to treat cartilage and then the MoCart system is uh, for post repair so if you're looking at how well your repair did and the most important thing I was going to say as far as the defect that we look at is the filling the cartilage filling how much of the cartilage fills the defect or how much of our repair fills the defect. And you see it has the highest score on the MoCart uh, section for that. Alignment is important. That's why we do these long leg views, because if we're in varus or valgus, we should always fix the, fix the concomitant problems but prior to any of the cartilage issues. Non-operative options are important. And I like just, just want to stress that just a little bit here, because even though I'm a surgeon, Non-operatively, like I said, most of these lesions are under a centimeter, and a lot of these lesions, when we see we, the patients are young, and we know that these recovery is a long period of time. Our goal is to improve pain, function, and delay surgery. Normal follow-up in a, in, or coming back, the earliest you can come back from an articular cartilage injury is from an OATS procedure, I'll talk about that, is six months. On average, most of these cartilage procedures take a year, and if someone's in the middle of their career, especially going back to sport, to lose 12 to 18 months of your career is difficult. So we try to always treat these uh, with non-operative management. Most importantly is that we can keep their function and we can delay surgery, minimize the effusions, we can keep them going. The things that we recommend, and this was by the AOS guidelines, is uh, anti-inflammatories for symptomatic relief, weight loss. Physical therapy is important, and one of the keys in physical therapy is maintaining range. We always talk about if you lose, start to lose that terminal extension or you start to lose flexion, it's key because then you're starting to decrease your surface area for that knee. And that when you decrease the surface area, you're increasing loads in that aspect. One of the things that they do not recommend is for just for any lesion without any plan is to just do arthroscopy. Uh, the only time we do arthroscopy is if we have mechanical symptoms. Otherwise, doing arthroscopy can cause another inflammatory response 
uh, it can actually, we, we show that it actually can increase it in the degenerative, when, if the knee started already in the degenerative process, it can actually increase your likelihood of getting a total knee replacement in the future. So what are the surgical indications and surgical candidate? Unacceptable pain, dysfunction, and failure of conservative management. This is a uh, important to understand that it is a complex problem. Uh, you have to, most of these patients were going to have several problems. Most of them have had a surgery before. They're coming in your second opinion or third opinion. Uh, most of these patients also uh, you have to see their expectations. So one of the most important things when I do with these patients, I, I usually give these patients at least 30 to 45 minutes, even an hour of my time, and actually see them two or three times prior to surgery. Because they have to understand it's a big surgery. If you have a ligament deficiency, you, get, you may have to do an ACL, PCL, or another ligament. Meniscal deficiency, you may have to do a meniscal transplant. Or malalignment, a lot of these patients will need an osteotomy. About 50% of the cases will need one of those procedures. And then the second part is they have to understand that it's a rigorous rehabilitation program. You know, I think rehab is so important in this aspect because rehab follows the repair, the filling of the defect, and anywhere along that point, you have to follow it through a year or any along that point, you can get failure. And then you have to let them know that it's, as I said previously, it takes about a year. And then finally, expectations. There's different expectations for the athlete versus the non-athlete or recreational. To get someone athletes at a high level, for example, they used to do microfactor for NBA players, only one third of them returned to a high level. Even though the microfactor did okay in the recreational athlete or the recreational um, weekend athlete, but it fit, microfactor failed in the elite athlete. So you have to understand your expectations. And then one other thing you have to know is whom not to operate on. Because I, I think a lot of times in surgery, we don't really realize whom not to operate on. We think we can fix anything. This is straight from um, regenerative medicine. And they showed, the, they called it the red knee. Anybody whose BMI is over 35, who has inflammatory arthritis, you can't operate. Diffuse cartilage loss. Bipolar lesions, we talk about lesions on both sides. Complete meniscectomies, ACLs, uh, significant chronic ligament uh, instability. Age over 55, they will have low mesenchymal stem cells and then malalignment. You can fix some of these, but if you have all these in combination, the chance of your success rate, there's studies that you have success rate up to 87%, and then there's also when you have a red knee, there's studies that your success rate drops down to 25%. So you want to make sure that you can be successful. Most cartilage surgeries, when we started out, like microfracture and chondroplasty, have always been around 60%. No matter what you did, you, got, you would get around 60%. Now, with the better techniques, better cartilage uh, procedures, we're getting around 75, 80%. So you want to make sure you have the ideal patient to reach that. As far as pain, uh, when we get articular pain, I have this algorithm. This is uh, my own, but I kind of followed a little bit from, I took a little bit from all my mentors and then everybody else who, uh, when I go to the meetings, uh, I start out, I think the most important, oops, the most important thing in this is the assessment. Once you understand that the patient needs surgery, you have to do the assessment. Alignment, instability, meniscal deficiency, you got to understand that. And then we go by size. Uh, size, location, depth, but important is less than, we, less than two centimeters or greater than two centimeters. And then we go through all these uh, procedures that we do commonly. I'm going to go through most of the procedures that we do at Aspatar, that available at Aspatar now. So I'll, I'll probably talk about all of them after this. But again, it's size. But the key point is to know the assessment. Because when I became uh, out of fellowship in my first couple of years in practice, I, I could do the ligament instability. And then I'll show you a video of a cartilage procedure. Most of the cartilage procedures are not difficult to do. They're just like cutting, pasting. It's almost like craft work when you're at a craft, uh, you know, at, at a workshop. But the, the, what, where the skill and the art came was when we, when we started doing the alignment, meniscal deficiency, and knowing which procedures and which procedures will be successful on the patient. Because we get to this point that, that doing most of the procedures is easy, but if you can't do an alignment, you, your, uh, uh, your cartilage procedure is going to fail. You can't, restore the meniscus, your cartilage procedure is going to fail. So you have to know how to do a meniscal transplantation, 
have to know how to do an alignment procedure. And of course, most fellowship trained sports docs can do an ACL or some type of ligament stability. As far as just instability, just a couple points. Uh, I mean, you could have a whole talk on ACL and uh, degenerative joint disease, but I just wanted to stress a few things. We know uh, from uh, in the US, we did the clinical practice guidelines. I actually worked on that and we decided that uh, we knew from the literature that 50 to 80% of the time, patients within five years after an ACL injury who remained active uh, got arthritic changes. My personal opinion is if you remain active after an ACL tear, you're going to get almost 100% chance you'll get a cartilage or meniscal injury. However, when we did the uh, clinical practice guidelines, we put it at five months. They should get it if they're going to stay, and they should not stay active. There was a new systemic review uh, by uh, an AJSM, and they showed that within three months, if you did it after three months, it increased the risk of injury in an active patient. The second thing uh, I wanted to talk about is congruency. Any increase in stability in any joint in the body can lead to early wear. Because if you look at even the total, uh, total knee uh, literature, when they, the better congruency you have, the less wear you get. It's the same thing in the knee and cartilage. If you have, lose congruency, you're going to get increased instability and you can lead to early wear. We did a study uh, at Hopkins when we looked at just the ACL degenerating away to mucoid, and we saw this subtle little instability and we followed it out and it was associated with increase in medial compartment degenerative joint disease. So, you know, even that subtle instability can lead to that. And then risk factors for poor outcome. Uh, so we, the new studies, so I, I, I wanted to add all these new studies that I just recently saw all in 2021. They did a 10 year randomized trial, uh, Brophy et al, and AJSM and a multi-center trial. And they showed that the basic, biggest risk factors at 10 years for failure of your ACL or poor outcomes, patient reported outcomes of your ACL is articular cartilage injury in the medial compartment or in the patellofemoral compartment. And that shows that if you have any medial uh, articular cartilage, I remember uh, just speaking of Freddie Fu, I remember I did a case with him when I was uh, visiting him. I visited him for six weeks. We did an ACL and then he had a chondral lesion on the medial side. And the first thing he said to me, He's like, we're going to do a perfect ACL, but that's not going to determine how well he does. It's going to be the cartilage lesions. So that's why I think even by any of the mentors all knew that as well. Synovial biomarkers, I just mentioned before, they, uh, they've they shown uh, biomarkers. If you saw an inflammatory environment within the knee, it's going to break down the knee faster as well. And that was by Christian Lattimore. And they they used uh, they looked at metalloproteinases and all these different enzymes, comp, and it showed that it was in, increase in wear and break down of the knee. Osteotomies, just straightforward. It, it, it's just changing the alignment of the knee. Normally the knee, 60% is on the medial side, 40% is on the lateral side. But if you just change by four or five degrees, either way, you increase it by 80 per, up to 80% versus 20%. So you can see even very three to four degrees difference in your alignment can cause significant load difference in the knee. Uh, it's important to, to, to evaluate that and make sure you know how to correct that. I mean, if you look at the study by Bode, a, the ACI success rate was about 89% versus about 59% if you didn't do the osteotomy. So it was a flip of the coin if you didn't do the osteotomy. Each one of these uh, topics is a talk in itself, but I just wanted to just briefly highlight it before talking about the procedures we do. The last one is meniscal transplantation. You can need at least a functional meniscus. Generally, when you look at the literature, it says at least 50%. You can, if you have a, a more than 50% torn, or you have a subtotal meniscectomy, like a radial tear that goes all the way to the uh, periphery, you're going to need a meniscal transplant. And you know, we used to talk about meniscal transplantation as being a bridging procedure. If there's cartilage damage, the goal again is to to protect the cartilage. So as I mentioned before, all these all these three things, load, instability, and meniscus is to protect our cartilage. They've had good success rate, I mean, 10 to 15 years, but if you get a person at 35 and you do his cartilage procedure, if you can get them to 60 or 55, 60, then if they have to get a knee replacement, then you're within the, the ballpark of when a knee replacement can be successful. But uh, moving on to key factors when treating these cartilage lesions. So location and grade. So one of the things uh, some people always ask me is, uh, 
But if you see a lesion in a non-weight bearing area, say, uh, would you do a, a cartilage uh, procedure on it? I go, no matter what the size is, if it's a non-weight bearing area, I would look at how much load it's getting on it. If it's not getting much load, it's probably not going to cause that much pain. That's why, like, when we see areas in the upper extremity, one thing is you can understand in the upper extremity, the cartilage is much thinner, probably about a millimeter in the proximal humerus. So we kind of tolerate more cartilage loss there than we do elsewhere just because of the weight bearing uh, aspect. If it's patellofemoral, you get significant shear. Uh, if you look at the patellofemoral cartilage as well, it's probably the thickest cartilage in the body. So seeing that extreme shear. And then you look at if the lesion is contained. If it's not fully contained, it makes the surgery a little more difficult and cause a little more pain. So that's also part of the aspect. And it also kind of leads you to which type of procedure to do. This is the ICRS grading scale. It's kind of based on the outer bridge classification. Like one is just getting a little softening of the cartilage, a little fissures. Two is getting to about 25 to 50%. And then three gets all the way to the subchondral bone. And then four actually penetrates the subchondral bone and you get severe, severe abnormality. Most of the lesions that we do any procedure on is going to be a three or four. One and two, we just kind of follow. And there's no real correlation of, unless uh, to see where it's going to go, and how fast it'll break down. When you get to, to uh, grade four, there's been some correlation about size. The bigger the size, the quicker it's going to break down. Again, also dependent on location. Size, as, as I just mentioned previously, is relative, right? Because if you have a big condyle and you got a 15 millimeter lesion, it looks pretty small. And then you give a small condyle, it looks much larger. So we always go by size, one centimeter, two centimeters. And essentially, it's more or less based for, in the US was based for insurance because you couldn't do a, a cellular generation technique or an osteochondriolograph unless you said it was two centimeters or bigger. If it, you said it was below two centimeters, then you'd have to do a like a, a peel. Just one of the things is we determine most of our procedures based on size. Uh, even though we go about relative size, but we actually look about at the percentage of the condyle or the load bearing area of the condyle. The next thing that we also look at is the depth. If it's just a chondral injury or it actually penetrates the subchondral bone. If it goes deep, then you're going to get more response and just putting a chondral uh, repair is not going to work. You sometimes you have to bone graft this or change this bone. So this makes a lot of difference. Uh, one of the things that people ask is like, if you just see a chondral injury, would you do a like an osteochondriolograph or autograph? But I always say, if it's a chondral injury, I'm going to leave it as a chondral injury as long as the subchondral bone is good. Because as I mentioned before, in the osteochondral unit, the subchondral bone is where all the action is and then the cartilage protects it. A lot of people talk about bone marrow lesions. Bone marrow lesions are essentially areas where the bone is getting increased stress. So it gets the increased stress. So essentially it's like a micro stress fracture. It's getting increased stress there and, and it's causing an inflammatory response, trying to get a healing response. And that happens because it's increased load, right? Any stress reaction or any stress is because the, the uh, bone cannot take the physiological load that's coming on. So when you lose the cartilage or essentially, this is where when you, we, we looked at before, you can see a bone marrow lesion underneath and the cartilage cap might be okay, but within a year, that cartilage is gonna fall apart because the bone's unhealthy underneath. Because essentially probably that cartilage is not doing its job. There's, if it's small, you can do a cell-based technique because a lot of times when you see this bone marrow lesion, if you, bone, uh, if you put a cartilage, lesion, a cartilage uh, patch on it or something, that bone marrow lesion gets better. But if you have these large diffuse bone marrow lesions, sometimes it's better to just actually do a uh, osteochondral procedure to remove that bone that's unhealthy. So essentially it's telling you this bone is significantly unhealthy. We've been doing a lot of, uh, when you talk about procedures, I just want to talk about one that's been around for a long time. And, uh, I mentioned it before by Lanny Johnson. I initially showed it as, as a abrasion arthroplasty, but we've kind of switched down to debridement. It's one of the more harmless uh, surgical aspects and it's and it's and it does not depend on lesion size uh it's a palliative procedure so one of the things we see is you see a chondral lesion is 
person that you're not sure of if uh, you should do a big procedure on, you want to get them through the season, but they're still limited by their chondral injury, you can do what we call a debridement or a chondroplasty. Uh, it's not, it's a primary treatment, but it's not considered a primary treatment. It's essentially setting you up for something in the future. And you can, it's nice to go in there, clean it up, as you can see in this patient, but and then you can measure, you can determine the depth of the bone, the depth of the injury, and then you can get them back to sport in the same year. Uh, Jimmy Andrews showed that you can get them back within uh, within three months, uh, but about two thirds of the time. But he also showed if you did a microfracture within the season, they were pretty much out for much four to almost four to five times less likely to return in the same season. So it was a lot longer to come back from microfracture. So as far as treatment options, these are the options that we do at Aspitar. So I want to just concentrate on stuff that we do at Aspitar to for uh, cartilage. We have multiple options for small lesions, but I want to let you know, uh, show you that you look at it here, you see it's a small lesion and we call these the shoulder. So in small lesions, the shoulder can protect the lesion for a long period of time. It's once it gets to moves out, then you actually get that falling in or that instability sign. But if, if this is located in a weight bearing area or, or somewhere where it takes a lot of load, this force can transmit and cause weight, as I showed before, like a bone marrow lesion underneath. So then if you, the, the theory is if you cover this or something like a durable repair tissue or high like tissue, this bone marrow edema or bone marrow lesion will improve. And generally most of the results that we see is where once we see improvement of this lesion, we see the pain go away as well. We the two options that we usually do is either a microfracture or an oats procedure. Microfracture again was has been the gold standard for almost 25 years, but recently has gone out of favor. Uh, I'm in the school of time to abandon microfracture. I don't think microfracture works. It's uh, it's been it's one of the most popular techniques because of cost effectiveness, and initially it showed that it had very good results. Uh, but if you look at it directly, it's low cost. But if there's a study that came out by Flanagan, and this is actually in 2021 as well, that show that that microfactor actually 10 years out of all the cartilage procedures they looked at uh, with it, like AMIC, um, I'll talk about Macy and also Conjallograph, was the only one that was not cost effective. Even though those other ones cost more directly up front, but down the road, it's not cost effective because you have to go back several times and it's got an unpredictable fill rate it changes the subchondral bone as you can see because essentially what you're doing is you're trying to crack the bone or make holes in the subchondral bone but you're injuring the subchondral bone as we said the cartilage covers the subchondral bone so you're actually injuring what you want to protect and then you're trying to see if you can get these mesochemical stem cells to come in and fill this with a clot with some healing potential they get osteophyte formation because that's your body will respond by making more bone and you can even get cyst formation. And some of your procedures actually have a worse success rate after a microfracture. So we found out that microfracture is not working well. So what we, the next step was to put a scaffold, which makes a little more sense. So when you put the scaffold, you're actually setting up uh, a bed for it to fill. And it, it essentially makes you take a, there's many different types of scaffolds. You make a little microfracture and then you put the scaffold in. The important thing is with the scaffold technique, and I think Dr. Papakostas uh, does it, and we did it in the States as well, we started using this nano drill because instead of injuring the subchondral bone, we stick this small nano drill and get deeper because you get into the more of the vascular channels and more of the mesenchymal stem cells. One, Two, you're not damaging the um, subchondral bone, and then you can get these stem cells out, and then you put this patch on. This patch is stemless, does not have any cellular stems in it. So there's two, uh, there's two types of patches that they call, one is cellular regeneration, and this is type of patch that, you're, that you put it on, and then you wait for the chondrogenesis to happen after the cells come out. So it, it induces chondrogenesis. Uh, and then a lot of people either inject PRP, or bone marrow aspirate concentrate into it to improve the mesenchymal stem cells to heal. The success rate on these, as I mentioned, there's uh, microfactors 
initial good term, all the studies show initial good term. And the other thing about microfactor is every procedure is compared to microfactors. It's been the gold standard for the last 20, 25 years. So you have to prove whatever procedure you do, you have to prove that it's better than microfactor. The problem was when a lot of these new procedures came out, microfactor does good short term up to about 18 months. Then it kind of falls off a cliff. So what if you look at all the studies now, all the systemic reviews, even level one and two, it's only good in the short term in low demand patients. So I, I'm pretty much gone away from microfactor, even with the nano. Uh, the only time I ever do any type of uh, nano drilling or anything is when you use a, a, a scaffold. And then scaffold systems actually are good. They have very um, better success. Uh, uh, recent studies show better success over microfactor ACI and oat at three years. Again, the matrix induced chondrogenesis has good success rate, but it's only short term right now in short midterm. It's more imp important to see the long term aspects. Osteochondral, uh, the next one is autologous osteochondral transfer. Uh, this is probably the, the go to for athletes that we do. Uh, at hospital specialty surgery, Riley Williams talks a lot about this. All we do is we're robbing Peter to pay Paul. We take cartilage from, as I mentioned before, a location where it's not what weight bearing or not really uh, that we're worried about you know, a loss of cartilage. And we just transfer it to an area where the cartilage is, is, the, is lost or the defect is. The big issue with this is, again, you only have a limited donor site. So you probably at the biggest you can do is a centimeter and a half, usually under two centimeters. Uh, we say under two centimeters, but usually at, at most you have about a centimeter and a half. Uh, large lesions you can't do. The patella, since the shape is different, is difficult. And uh, the other good thing is it has very good success in athletes. So most people from the Riley Williams study have switched from um, microfactor uh, to the OATS procedure for athletes if you want to get a return to activity the fastest. This has the fastest return to sport of all of them. So it's and so that's why a lot of people are using this in the athlete, especially to not take them out more than a year. Larger lesions, we usually are larger and they, they're more symptomatic, as you can see here. So we have two types of options for them. We either have osteochondral allografts, which we're starting to do here at Aspatar, and then cellular restoration techniques. The osteochondral allograft is just similar to the OATS procedure, except you get it from the uh, 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 fresh donor from a, a, a you know um, bone bank, a bank, a tissue bank. You get it from a tissue bank. What you do is you you size it, you measure it, and then you and then they send it to you, and then you have to use this within. A couple days. Usually the fresh grafts are only good for 28 days, but by the time they process it and they send it, you only have two to three days. So you don't have a lot of time, but it's it shows the advantages are no donor site morbidity, but it is technically difficult because if you have a two a big lesion, you may have to put we call a snowman technique. You may have to put a couple of them and it becomes difficult. And then the last is the, the risks with standard with allograft immune response to disease transmission. Very rarely I've seen that. I've seen one graft we absorb, but most of the time it, it's pretty good as far as uh, um, as far as immune response. And the other big issue with this is gravid availability. I mean, usually you have to wait a couple, you know, a couple weeks, even months to get a graft. Has excellent success, uh, 80, uh, 75 percent at 15 years. Uh, the biggest issue is again that it, it, graft availability. And it's difficult for the knee patella. They started. This was a. We used to. This was like a forty-year-old person. Uh, we used to use a different technique, but now they've got this. We could we replace the whole chondral surface with the allograft. So we had new, better techniques now, so we can change the whole chondral surface. It's almost like doing a mini knee replacement, uni replacement with the chondral surface. Another patient we did an osteotomy, and you can see we actually replaced their whole medial femoral condyle. Patella femoral osteochondral grafts, they do very well. The biggest issue with them is, again, uh, graft availability in a difficult area to work at. Uh, Andres Gamal and Jack Farr have shown they have done decent, but 
Again, it's very difficult to get grafts. I mean, if you do one of these procedures, it's going to take months, so there's better options. One of the better options for this is Cardi One. These are slides um, from uh, Dr. Papakos, let me borrow them. He was, uh, he's very well uh, trained in Cardi One. Essentially, the difference there is you take one, uh, at the time you take a, a membrane, like the one we did for the previous one that had no cells. You actually take hardly cells from the patient and themselves from an area, just like an oats procedure. You mince them up, you isolate them, and then you put them into this scaffold, and then you put the scaffold back into the patient. It's one stage, it's low cost, no real regulatory issues, and it's autologous since it's it's from your own from the own patient. The important thing is it's there's no growth factors required. It's interesting. It comes with this whole little setup lab. And then you make the you get once you get the cells, the lab goes to work. And then this is a patient that Dr. Papakosis did. You can see the cartilage lesion here. At, at six weeks, at three months, at six months, and at a year. You can see how the new cartilage came in. Right there. So it's a nice procedure, it's one stage. And it's done very well, uh, early to midterm results. So uh, I think Dr. Uh, Papakos is starting at Aspatar now, so it's going to be nice we're going to have it here as well. The one that I did the most with in the States, and I just I wanted to shoot this uh, briefly, just about the matrix associated chondrocyte implantation. The, the, this is when you harvest, the, just like you did on the other one with one stage, but you, you actually take the cells and then you expand them. You, then you put them on a membrane. The membrane keeps about 500,000 to a million chondrocytes on it. And then you glue the membrane back into the patient. So it's a six weeks process. For, you take the graft, you take the cells, you expand them, put them on a graft, and then you put the graft back into the patient. The problem with this procedure is one, it's two stages uh, and cost. But unlike uh, what I mentioned before, they did the, when they did the study as cost effectiveness of 10 years, this was actually cheaper than microfracture. The nice thing about this is it's shown to make hyaline like cartilage histo histologically, so it's closest that we can get to hyaline like cartilage. We did a study at Hopkins that we got published uh, that instead of doing two stages, we did it with one stage. What we did is during the time where they would get their CT arthrogram for their, to determine their uh, depth of the lesion and to, to kind of evaluate the lesion, we would actually harvest the um, chondral biopsy at the time of CT. So we did CT guided biopsies, we would send it and then we would do surgery afterwards. This has evolved, it went from periosteum to membrane that you'd sew, now it's quick, you just glue it in. It's a quick little video. Almost all your cartilage procedures have, are very similar. You have to clean the area, you see the subchondral bone. And then let me move it up a little bit. And then you measure it, template it. And you cut it out almost all those all the cellular procedures are about the same when you're doing this. And then at the end, you just kind of glue it. Uh, and then you just put it in the patch into the pothole and then you just kind of glue it and then you just make sure it's stable. This is a patient that I did 25 years old. You can see big loss of cartilage. Oops. And then we did the surgery and then you can see before and after you got all this fell back. This is only at six months, so it continues. This actually matures all up to two years. Even so there's some studies up to three years it can mature. And it's had excellent results. I mean, at five years, Perspective randomized study uh, by Matt Braveberg and Dan Saris show that at five years it, it still stays and it keeps its results better than microfracture. As microfracture goes on, it gets worse, and there's a lot of five year follow up on this that does very well with it. It's also the what we say is the um, go to for patellofemoral joint is the cellular technique, the technique that we just mentioned, uh, either the CARDI one or the um, Macy, since we have the CARDI-1, I think it would be very well for patellofemoral lesions because osteochondrolograph is tough and, it, and it's
going to be the workhorse or the first line. And there's several studies have shown for patellofemoral, it's actually cost effective compared to the other uh, microfracture or even chondroplasty. As far as rehab, uh, the weight bearing status, it's important to understand about rehab for this. Most of these uh, cartilage procedures are non weight bearing. And the reason we do that is we determine we, we don't want to put any stress on the subchondral bone or on the patch or anything that we put in there while it's maturing. So we, we call that implantation protection. As the as the 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 uh, defect fills, we increase weight bearing, right? So we follow the weight bearing follows the fill of the defect. And sometimes we combine the uh, pro uh, the protocols with the other procedure like um, uh, osteotomy or a meniscal transplant. If it's a meniscal transplant, we limit the motion just a little bit more than we do. Usually we leave unlimited range of motion. And then always we, we, we start with a continuous passive motion or any type of range of motion since these areas are going to have a significant scar formation. So we don't want to make sure we, we don't get scars. We keep, we do, we call it a continuous passive motion. And the maturity of the graft determines how, when we can weight bear and return to sport generally six to 18 months. And as far as return to sport, the fastest is the oats and the most successful is the oats. So makes sense, small lesion, you're using a small cartilage. The second uh, is osteochondriolograph and Macy, and you can see microfracture is nine months to come back and it's only about a 58% success rate. The, uh, the oats and the Macy are the best. Uh, and uh, if you look, we're getting up to 80%. When we started, doing this type of procedure, we were we were around 60% for almost all cartilage procedures. So we've gotten much better. We're nowhere near 90 yet, or maybe in a specific individual patient, but as a general, we're always between 75 and 80%. I think we're gonna get better, but I think right now, just because I don't think we're getting fast enough, but I don't also think we should be operating on asymptomatic patients. One, a couple other points, no new technologies continue to be introduced. But all of these failed, so you know, make sure we have data. I'm a data-driven guy. Don't jump into doing another procedure unless you got some data, and especially mid to long term. Short term data is always okay because you're not doing anything. You're not weight bearing. You're just range of motion. But as soon as you weight bear, that's when you're going to determine, and as soon as you increase activity. This slide, I just want to mention a couple things. Uh, we, we started out just symptomatically treating these patients. We went on to the restoration procedures with bone marrow and uh, stimulation first. Then we went to osteochondral autographs. Now we're in cellular regenerative medicine, right? With the uh, CARDI-1, ACI. We've gone this far. I think the future is going to be in more restoration approaches to be developed. Uh, there's two things in phase two trials in the States. One is um, spree Furman. It's a fibroblast growth factor 18. It's actually shown the increased thickness in cartilage. And the FDA, and then the other one is angiopoietin like three, which kind of decreases the breakdown of cartilage and is supposed to help the development of cartilage. So that's going to be in the future. Uh, PRP stem cells are involved already, but there's not that many studies on uh, mesenchymal stem cells. Recent studies just showed that 90% of level one studies is on PRP right now, not much on stem cells. So that'll be something in the future and maybe synthetic or natural polymers for our scaffolds. In summary, uh, the osteochondral unit is the building block. Cartilage repair is challenging, but don't underestimate the role of non-operative management. Uh, important to understand the concomitant pathology. You can't be a cartilage surgeon unless you did all the, be able to do all the alignment, stability, or meniscal. This is a patient with a, with a giant lesion. Uh, she actually sent me a picture that she climbed this uh, small mountain, so she was wanted to let me know. Uh, one of the other things I want to say is know your surgical ind indication and whom to operate on. And then choose a strategy that does not burn bridges. As we mentioned, microfracture might be out of the, the, the realm now. And then know all your techniques and then know in the future what the new techniques are coming, but have the data. I wanted to say, uh, Dr. Paul mentioned about the first joint uh, restoration Congress here. I wanted to say one thing about it is that uh, most of the papers I uh, actually uh, referenced, a lot of those authors are going to be at this conference. So at least I know seven or eight of them. 
will be at this conference. So it's going to be nice. Uh, I think it'll be a great conference. We welcome everybody to attend and then thank you.